Hi everybody, and thank you so much for coming out to Seattle. I am thrilled to welcome you here to our first ever Cloud Native Con, uh, co-located with KubeCon and Prometheus Day, and we'll also be talking about open tracing and even a surprise new project. Um, so I uh, do want to apologize at the get-go that things are a little crowded. Um, folks coming in should definitely uh, try and find a seat. We oversold the event, which is fantastic news. We underestimated the uh, amount of demand for this, uh, all these projects, and I, I think we're very much on the ascending side of the uh, hype curve. But uh, as I'll talk about, we're, uh, we're going to keep growing and, and make room for more folks. So uh, I'm going to give you a, hopefully a pretty brief cloud native state of the union. Uh, where we came from and my own personal uh, interpretation of a history of the cloud, why we're here and excited about cloud native technology, uh, what we can do better, and there are multiple things, the, to a little patting on the back of things we're doing well, and then a, a little hint forward on where we're going. Uh, but before I start, I would like to uh, very much thank our sponsors, our uh, Diamond sponsors, Apprenda, Cisco, CoreOS, Google Cloud Platform, Huawei, IBM, Intel, and Red Hat are platinum sponsors, Tigera, VMware, Weaveworks, and you can see we have a, a number of great companies for gold sponsors, and the silver folks, I urge you to please uh, go out and chat with these people. They all have um, interesting stories. They, uh, I do think that it's the hallway track and uh, some of the booth interactions can be parts of the most valuable uh, pieces of these conferences, and of course, we couldn't be here without these folks, so thank you all very much. Okay, so a brief history of the cloud. Uh, let's go back in time to 2000. I was a venture capitalist in Palo Alto, and uh, companies would come to me and say, yeah, we have this little idea, this little thing we need to do. We need $2 million just to buy the hardware to get going based on our hope of what the demand would be, uh, will be. And uh, so the building block of an application was a physical server. And when you needed to expand or deploy a new application, you would call up your Sun salesperson and say, I need a new server or maybe a new rack of them, which is why Sun was doing so well for a while there. Um, and then we uh, bring our time machine forward 2001. You had VMware popularize the concept of virtual machines. So now you can uh, put your application into a VM. It thinks it has, has its own server, but in fact, you can multiplex multiple VMs on the same physical server. And that really uh, completely changed the way people think about deploying applications, that the building block of an application as you're thinking about it becomes a VM, not a physical machine. Fast forward to 2006, when uh, Amazon Web Services launched EC2, really um, popularized the concept of IaaS, and uh, this was just a, a massive change that you no longer needed to uh, pre-buy all your servers. They stopped being CapEx that you had to raise tons of money for. They became an operating expense. You could uh, expand and, and contract by the hour. And, uh, but interestingly, the architectural building block was still the same thing. It was a VM. It was just renamed to be an AMI, uh, an Amazon mach machine image. And now we jump to 2009, and you had this startup Heroku, which I think for uh, many of us really changed the way we thought about application development, uh, popularized the, the whole concept of DevOps. And the idea was that if you follow these rules, what they called a 12-factor application about uh, how you dealt with stateful data and the deployment mechanism and a few other things that uh, you had this magic experience as you made an improvement or fixed a bug or rolled out a new feature, you can type git push Heroku and a few seconds later you would see that new version live on the website and it really was just and still is an incredible experience. Now uh, it turns out that Heroku uses containers but that process is totally opaque to uh, the consumer uh, and uh, they don't even really think of things called build packs. Okay, so those are the halfway through our tour here. Interestingly, that's the end of the proprietary companies. Now we jump to open source. And so in 2010, you had uh, OpenStack from NASA and Rackspace, and then a slew of other country companies joined in. And in a lot of ways, they were just taking what VMware had done and what uh, AWS was doing and saying, okay, can we create an open source platform for this that any company 
can roll this out and have their own IaaS offering, or individual enterprises can do this and, and, and have an EC2-like offering. But, um, and it, I think it took a little longer than they wanted it to, there were some hiccups along the way, but this ultimately did fulfill its original vision. Uh, but it's important to f f note that the building block remained a virtual machine. Now we go to 2011, when uh, Pivotal created the Cloud Foundry platform, and this has um, a, some subtleties to it and some extra features and other sorts of things, but for a ton of users, especially big enterprises, it was really an open source alternative to Heroku. And um, it created that kind of magic of a continuous deployment, uh, pipeline, 12-factor app uh, rollout, but uh, doing it on lots of different hardware and not just, uh, not just with Heroku. And then we uh, fast forward to 2013 when uh, Docker came out. And um, what's interesting about Docker, I, I think of it like um, Tim Berners-Lee creating the World Wide Web, where you look at what was in there and you say, boy, you know, HTTP wasn't actually that different from FTP, and HTML was kind of based on XML, and URLs aren't actually that innovative, and yet sometimes when you just glue together these existing technologies in the right way, and critically, create a really usable user interface around it, magic happens. And similarly, uh, Solomon Hikes took LXC and Union File Systems and C Groups, these different features that were already in the kernel, and he kind of married them together and with a little secret sauce um, around uh, usability, has produced what's really been the fastest uptake of a developer technology ever, that you don't need to have a complete operating system uh, around your application. The application can be contained, can uh, live next to other apps. And um, we'll go through it, but you get things like isolation, reuse, immutability. Um, and so this was a, a critical moment because the building block of the application was no longer a VM, but now became a container. And then uh, we'll fast forward to December 2015 of uh, cloud native. And we define cloud native as having three key components to it. So you take your application and you divide it up into different pieces, what we call microservices, where each of those can be running its own, on its own framework, on its own programming language, with different dependencies, with different versions, uh, and, it would, and it's incredibly helpful as your team gets bigger that everyone doesn't have to be committing to the same repo. Then you package each of those microservices up into its own container, and critically, you dynamically orchestrate those containers in order to optimize the resource utilization. So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation was formed in December 2015. Um, Google donated Kubernetes, which um, of course is uh, behind KubeCon and uh, why many of us are here, uh, but then we've also had Prometheus and other projects, and uh, we are now, uh, try and tell a story about uh, where this goes. So, what have we learned from that process? The core building block went from servers to VMs to build packs, that's the Heroku Cloud Foundry, to containers. That's from heavier to lighter weight, both in spin-up time and size. The immutability is a key point that uh, this concept of uh, treating your servers and your containers like cattle and not like pets. Uh, that no one should ever be individually configuring anything, everything's reproducible. And then the provider has gone from closed source from a single company to open source cross-vendor so that all of these projects uh, and the stack is available to download and then you can get commercial support from a vendor if you want it or need it and if you're not happy you can go to a different vendor or a different cloud and still stick with the same stack. Uh, and then I'll just mention PaaS because um, I do think there's a, still a ton of magic around 12-factor, and I kind of estimate that for most companies, 80% of their applications fit great into a PaaS environment. Um, but what's interesting about Kubernetes and other cloud-native orchestration platforms is that they represent a great base for building a PaaS on top of. And so you see Red Hat with OpenShift, Huawei has uh, CCE, uh, Deus has Workflow, Apprenda has their own PaaS. These are all um, platforms that are built on top of Kubernetes. And this is great because many applications start out as a 12-factor app that's perfect for PaaS. Sometimes they uh, outgrow it. Some apps uh, never actually fit a PaaS model. So uh, PaaS on top of a cloud-native platform supports all those deployment models. Okay, so that's the, the at least my interpretation of uh, history the last 16 years or so. Why are we excited about cloud native? So the key value propositions, uh, isolation, and so this is um, my Docker slide because uh, 
they really did uh, pioneer this. So the idea that when you can uh, containerize your application, you get dev prod parity, you can have the same version in development and production, you have faster code and component reuse, you can uh, simplify operations. We get um, no lock-in. And so this is just the story of open source, that there are lots of vendors out in the hallway who are eager to help you and um, work with you, but when you pick one of them, you're not stuck for the next decade if they're not meeting your needs. Uh, scalability. So this actually, this statistic from Google is uh, two years old now, but that they, at that point, they were starting two billion containers per week, which uh, I believe is 1,300 a minute. And uh, it, the idea is that you can scale to tens of thousands of self-healing multi-tenant nodes. And actually, several of our presentations today are gonna talk about uh, some of the biggest implementations out there. The one that uh, my young sons are particularly impressed by is that uh, Pokemon Go, you might have seen, is, is running on Kubernetes today. Yes. <laughs> and um, agility and maintainability, so I'm talking about microservices here. I'll give a quick shout out to these incredibly productive pirates who uh, really had to work hard to get those containers into the different boats. But the idea is that you put each of the uh, applications in a container, you define how they depend on each other, uh, these explicitly described dependencies, and each of the containers can scale separately. And then, uh, our orchestration picture, so improved efficiency and resource utilization that you dynamically manage and schedule the microservices. You don't have to just set it up and hope that it's correct. You can explain to the cluster what the demands are and have it adjust dynamically based on demand and other requirements. And that also brings us to resiliency so that your individual containers can fail, your machine can fail, even entire data centers. You can respond to varying levels of demand and your application keeps running the way you expect it to. So that's the um, goal of cloud native computing. Now let's dive into the cloud native computing foundation for a second and say, where are we not yet doing well enough? So the first one is, I want to apologize that this is a very crowded uh, environment. I will mention there's some seats on the front right here if folks do want to sit down. So um, we oversold the space. We had a, a large wait list. It's great that we're in demand. I feel terrible that these folks uh, couldn't come and learn about all this stuff and interact with you. We were able to sell a few uh, booth passes, which is helpful. But um, as I'll talk about, we're uh, gonna respond to this by uh, having more capacity in, for our events in 2017. A another area where as a community and um, as a foundation, we're not doing well enough yet is diversity. So we're really eager to encourage women and other underrepresented minorities to participate in the projects, to attend the conferences, um, to really take part in all the different aspects of our community, and uh, we wanna find uh, better ways of doing that. I do wanna call out to Tigera, who sponsored uh, the majority of the funding for our diversity scholarships at this event, um, but I also want to say that for 2017, we're hoping to find corporate sponsors for it, but whether we do or not, we're going to be tripling the funding of our diversity scholarships, and it's actually going to be triple this event for each of our um, spring event in Europe and our winter event in North America, so it'll actually be six times higher. Uh, documentation, this is just a classic complaint of any fast growing project that it doesn't uh, stay up to date, that the intro to it is not quite as good as it should be, that when you reach strange edge cases, they're not documented as well. Uh, CNCF is providing funding uh, to all of our member projects, 20K per year that they can spend with their existing committers and contributors to improve documentation, but we're gonna be significantly ramping that up. And I think it's Kubernetes is the biggest project and the fastest growing one that people have the most complaints about, but we're really eager to work with the community to improve this. And then I'll just make a more general term, which is we're the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, the term cloud native, I think is still nascent. It, it doesn't have a bad connotation. It's not that people associate it with anything negative, but it just doesn't have a lot of meaning at this point. I really think of it mainly as an empty vessel that all of us can pour meaning into. And so um, I would make a specific ask of everyone here by communicating that the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is the home of Kubernetes, Prometheus, Open Tracing, uh, soon many other projects. And um, we do talk about this as Cloud Native Con that um, we're hosting multiple projects, and then KubeCon is a hugely important and, and the biggest part 
of cloud native con, but we really are trying to, to get across this concept of cloud native. Um, and then the final piece really uh, was my kind of personal, and I should mention I've just been the executive director for five months, but this is the area that I've kind of started on uh, most slowly. So when CNCF was set up um, about 11 months ago, the idea is it has a three-legged stool. So vendors uh, really fund the organization and run the governing board. Uh, developers are on the technical oversight committee, so we have folks like Solomon Hikes from Docker and Ben Heinemann from Mesosphere and Brian Grant from Google and uh, a number of other folks. And then um, we're supposed to have an end user board. And um, I uh, have been slow on building that out, but we also had the wrong price point for it. So um, I want to really thank our current three members, Goldman, eBay, and then Seesaw. But with the governing board, we made the decision to uh, dramatically lower the pricing for end user supporters. So what was uh, in the past $7,000 for a small startup or $50,000 for a big company, we're dropping that price down to the cost of two cloud native con tickets for a startup or five cloud native con tickets for a big company and we're throwing in those tickets. So uh, this is really a call for all of you who represent end user companies and my definition of that is if you're not providing uh, Kubernetes as a service, Prometheus as a service, uh, uh, a cloud native service to your end user, if you're a Twitter or a Pokemon Go or a company doing anything else, uh, then you're an end user. And um, please reach out to me. And uh, in fact, I may be reaching out to you if I can find you because uh, we think there's a great opportunity here. We're gonna be having monthly calls. We're gonna have interactions with the technical oversight committee. We wanna hear from you on the kind of problems you're running into. We can often make referrals or suggestions um, but we want to have that feedback loop, which is designed to balance out the, the vendors on the governing board and the developers on the TOC. Okay, so that's the, uh, the negatives. Now let's talk about all the things that are going great. So uh, I'm going to look through membership, project offerings, uh, announce a landscape project, talk about the projects, and then uh, finish with the events. First of all, I'm thrilled to announce that we have a new Platinum member, Samsung SDS. This is uh, essentially the consulting professional services arm of Samsung. They're based right here in Seattle. And I think uh, many of you have encountered Bob Wise and his team over the past. They were really one of the very earliest members of Kubernetes and uh, have been just instrumental supporters along the way. So um, they uh, formed and led the first official SIG, which was for scalability, and they co-lead the testing SIG, which is critical to cross-cloud parity and uh, one of the big goals of CNCF, that this same stack works everywhere. So we're thrilled to have them in CNCF, on the board, uh, contributing, and as I'll talk about in a second, uh, also helping on, uh, on certification. I also want to mention uh, three new Silver members who just joined in the last week. Uh, Canonical, most folks are very familiar with Ubuntu and may have seen that Canonical just announced uh, commercial support for Kubernetes. DigitalOcean is the um, hosting company that I, I think of as sort of beloved by hackers and people starting out that with their $5 a month droplets. Um, and they're uh, using Kubernetes and Prometheus internally today and, and, and uh, we'll see if that becomes external in the future. And then Livewire is a, a consultancy in, based in London that uh, is also providing great uh, Kubernetes support. So I'd like to thank all of them for joining. Uh, that brings us up to 63 members. So we're really um, thrilled to have pulled together a huge um, swath of the industry of folks interested in orchestration, containers, uh, microservices. We are actively recruiting um, for new members. Also, as I said, we're going to be um, really ramping up the end user side of this uh, in particular. And um, please reach out to me if, uh, if you might be interested. Uh, or cncf.io slash join. Um, so now let me just talk a second about kind of CNCF's role. What's interesting is that uh, I was the uh, COO of the Linux Foundation from 2006 to 2010 when GitHub was sort of just getting traction. And what people look for in a software foundation I think has really changed in the, uh, in the decades since then. So for us to say, oh, we'll give you a software repo or a mailing list or a free website just doesn't have a lot of really any value to the projects that we're talking to. But um, what we're trying to say is that CNCF is the best place to host cloud-native software projects. 
So uh, this is our value proposition slide, and I do want to emphasize that the first bullet is actually the most important one, that a neutral home increases contributions uh, and collaboration. So for software projects that are out there that uh, often start from a single individual or a single company and say, okay, how can I grow this? How do, can I expand it? We think CNCF is a great answer for that. But uh, then we have all these other advantages. I talked about the nine members of our technical oversight committee. It requires a supermajority vote of that group to bring any new project in. So it, it represents an endorsement by some of the top thinkers in the industry. We have this uh, $15 million, 1,000 node community cluster that was very generously donated to us by Intel. It's hosted uh, at SuperNAP in Las Vegas. Now, interestingly, we do actually make this available to any open source project that is moving cloud native technologies forward, but we give priority access to CNCF projects and CNCF members. We um, are building up this end user board and we'll offer engagement with it. We have a great full-time press relation analyst relation teams that work with the individual projects and, and connecting them with reporters and other interested folks. I mentioned this $20,000 per year that we're making available to each project to improve documentation. And our preference is for those projects to find existing uh, contributors and committers to, who can do that work because we find that they're often the best one. Uh, when a project comes in, we don't require them to adopt a CNCF process. All we uh, ask is that they document their existing pro process and that it be unbiased. Uh, we have a full-time staff, starting with me and uh, my colleague Chris Anschek, who are eager to assist new projects and, and just answer the questions and, and help them out on things. We have a world-class events team, as I think everybody can see here from this, um, this great event that they put together, that we're uh, doing Cloud Native Con. Uh, KubeCon events around the world, but we can also help uh, projects with individual events uh, when, they, when they want them. We have a really amazing uh, worldwide meetup group that can introduce folks to ne new technologies. And starting in January, we're going to be beta testing a set of cloud native roadshows. We're going to be reaching out to three or four cities in a week in a region, starting with uh, Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver and um, try and bring in new end users and kind of a cloud native 101 type offering. And then uh, we have a, a pretty neat marketing demo where we're uh, connecting together all the projects and showing how they can run real workloads on multiple different clouds as well as on our own bare metal. Okay, so then I wanted to uh, let you know about a project that uh, we're just announcing today. This is the cloud native reference architecture. It's um, a vote or two away from being approved by the technical oversight committee and uh, talks about the different layers in, uh, in a stack. And we've been working with uh, Redpoint Venture Capital in, um, in Silicon Valley to try and build a landscape. So I'm going to give you a peek at uh, the 0 0.9 version of this landscape that we're announcing today. And this just went live on uh, GitHub. It's, uh, that, um, but the thing that I want to emphasize to you is that this is wrong. So I guarantee you there are errors in it. Uh, your project may be missing it from it, your company may be missing from it, and I can already tell you that the chairperson of our technical oversight committee, Alexis Richardson, does not like the way we've organized storage and networking on here. So we're going to be tweaking this and making changes to it. But our goal is to actually have this as an open source project that we're going to be uh, accepting suggestions for it. We're also going to be creating an interactive site where folks can click through on any of these uh, icons and find out about the company or the project behind it. But um, we do feel like part of the CNCF's role and thought leadership is to try and tell a story about how the different companies and projects fit together in the space. And it's actually quite helpful. Uh, yeah, here um, is the URL for it, uh, github.com slash CNCF slash landscape. We're also publishing this uh, under a Creative Commons by attribution 4.0 license. So anyone's welcome to make use of it, and uh, we encourage that, uh, especially when we release our 1.0 version in a few more weeks. But we would love your feedback. You can log on right now and say, you screwed up this part of it. Please fix this. And I've, I've actually already gotten my first comment about one of the logos is out of date. So um, here were our projects as of yesterday morning. And you can see Kubernetes in the orchestration and management layer. You can see Prometheus up under observability and analysis uh, as a monitoring project. And then uh, Open Tracing, which is our, was our newest project uh, last month, uh, under tracing. But um, 
I'm excited to report that uh, as of last night, the Technical Oversight Committee just voted to adopt in Fluent D as the fourth project in CNCF. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, we're thrilled for them. And um, this is a data collector for a unified logging layer. They have uh, an amazing collection of 300 plugins for all kinds of uh, different apps that they feed that information through. It's used by over 2,000 companies. And um, we've really been thrilled working with uh, developers behind it who've just been incredibly supportive and responsive and uh, addressing some of the concerns of our TOC. So here's our uh, updated chart where I get to put the fourth uh, circle on here. And that um, then brings me to where are we going? So uh, this next chart, I'm gonna give you a little insight into what our technical oversight committee is thinking about. Um, and that is the green circles here. But um, I really wanna promise you, the only thing that I'm certain of is that not all of these projects are actually gonna become CNCF hosted projects and that some things that are not listed here or are not currently circled will. And so we have a, a TOC, uh, public call every uh, first Monday and uh, first and third Wednesday of the month where we talk about these, these projects come in and present to us and uh, we work with them and, and put together proposals and um, at the end of the day the TOC decides which, uh, which projects are going to come in. I'll give you just a slightly clearer view of that but that just talks about the kinds of spaces that we're looking at. So tracing, messaging, stream processing, networking, configuration, RPC proxy, protocol buffers, naming uh, databases, and storage. Uh, and again, I can guarantee you this will not be the actual list, but it will have some overlap with uh, the list of projects that, that come in. The other um, piece that I'm thrilled to announce today is that CNCF is uh, announcing a new certification and training program. And so what we're doing is uh, starting today, spinning up a certification working group of um, starting with Kubernetes experts who are gonna to put together an open source Kubernetes curriculum, which is essentially a list of everything that you, need to, you should know if you are a Kubernetes expert. We're then creating, uh, with the Linux Foundation, an online proctored certification program that will test that curriculum. And um, in addition, we're doing a, a free, uh, massively open online course, MOOC with edX. The Linux Foundation has had a great success with that platform. Over 750,000 people have enrolled in our uh, Intro to Linux program. And that MOOC is gonna cover the introductory sections of the curriculum. And then we'll be offering a, uh, a training program, or the Linux Foundation will, uh, that will cover the rest of the curriculum. But in addition, all, any other company is also welcome to offer that training. And then the idea is that uh, Prometheus and Open Tracing, and I should now add Fluent D modules covering these additional projects can be added in over time. So uh, those programs are then gonna enable us to uh, create what we're calling Kubernetes Managed Service Providers. And so uh, these are companies who fulfill the following three requirements. They have three or more certified engineers. I do wanna make clear that the certification program is for people, not for software. Uh, that we're assuming that the software people are, are using is extremely uh, similar to what's in uh, the head of, of Kubernetes. The uh, demonstrable activity in the Kubernetes community so that they're active contributors and a business model that they can support enterprise end users. And this is coming from uh, our members and folks that we're talking to that are really looking for help in sometimes in deploying Kubernetes and would like to have a list of folks that they can trust are, are some of the top companies in this space. Um, and so uh, we're just sent out a press release talking about a number of companies that have committed to become uh, KMSPs, but uh, this program is available to anyone. So if you're a vendor in this space, I really encourage you to look into it. The certification working group mailing list just went live and is available via, you'll see the link on the press release. And uh, we're gonna be doing an in-person meeting very likely in the next few weeks uh, or mid-December where uh, we get everybody together in a room and hash out what should be in that curriculum. And then that's going to inform the training and the certification we're building. And then finally, I'm thrilled to announce our uh, 2017 events. So um, we have hopefully learned the lesson on capacity and in 
uh, March 29th and 30th, we're going to be holding Cloud Native Con slash KubeCon Europe in Berlin. And uh, we had a capacity of 500 in London last year. We're tripling that to be able to handle 1,500 people. And uh, as of right now, the uh, call for papers, the registration, and the sponsorship are all open. So I would uh, urge you, if you barely got a ticket or uh, here, or if you know people who didn't, or know especially folks in Europe who couldn't make the trip over, to please go to events.linuxfoundation.org and go ahead and register and buy a ticket. And uh, for the vendors in the audience, I want to say that we um, just opened up the sponsorship for this. So you can download a PDF of the opportunities. In particular, unlike this event, where we had eight diamond sponsors, which was a little too much, we're limiting it for both of these events to only five diamond sponsors. And it's essentially the first five companies that can fill out a contract, uh, probably today, are going to be those diamond sponsors for both of those events. But for other companies, we have great platinum, gold, silver sponsorships. We would love to have you engaged and involved with us. We also have a whole bunch of other sponsorship opportunities around things like uh, the diversity scholarships and fun runs and evening events and other stuff. So um, please go online, take a look at it. And then critically, the call for papers is open. So uh, we, if you have a proposal, uh, that didn't get accepted here, if you're inspired by a talk today, if you have a story in your company that you'd like to share, please go ahead and fill that out. We uh, are uh, really, this is what makes the whole community go round, is to have a, a, just a diverse, really interesting set of, of speakers and presenters. Um, and then uh, we're also announcing Cloud Native Con North America, which we're moving back a few weeks, but it's going to be in Austin, Texas, December 6th and 7th. And we have a capacity of about 1,000 here in Seattle. We're tripling that for Austin to 3,000. And uh, the registration and sponsorships are now open. I, I don't, it doesn't really make sense to do a call for papers quite yet. So uh, events.linuxfoundation.org, please take a look at it, send it to your colleagues, get the word out. We would, uh, we're incredibly excited about continuing the momentum uh, behind these events. And, uh, and going forward with you. And so um, just a few uh, final notes for um, the next two days. Um, tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, in the Grand Ballroom foyer right outside is our sponsor showcase and booth crawl. So um, that's when uh, we'll have some uh, adult beverages and uh, other, kind, uh, other beverages. We encourage you to go out the hallway track, uh, interact with our booth folks. Then at 7 p.m., we're all going to migrate over to the Seattle Art Museum, which is uh, just a few blocks away, and we're going to have folks with maps and umbrellas if we need them. And folks might have heard that there's an election going on. So uh, for both the sponsor showcase and the Seattle Art Museum event, we're going to have big TVs set up uh, to see the results as they come in and hopefully talk about uh, some cloud native stuff uh, in between those, uh, those <laughs> results. Um, and then I also want to call out the, uh, the diversity luncheon program that uh, we're holding tomorrow. And this is um, uh, open to all invitees, uh, all attendees. So um, it, it's an opportunity to talk about diversity and how to improve it uh, in our community. We, we do just request or uh, require that you register ahead of time. So you can go on the website right now if you're interested in doing that. And the Lule restaurant is, is basically just connected to the hotel. So, uh, so please take a look. And so uh, with that, I'm just going to thank our sponsors one more time because uh, we really do appreciate all these companies stepping up. We couldn't uh, be here without it, and it's just a great chance for us to, uh, to hear what they're up to. Um, and uh, that's my contact info. So please reach out to me. Uh, grab me in the hallway the next two days. Or if you don't see me, uh, tweet or email, and I would love to, uh, to chat with you and, and, and hear about how we can, uh, can work together. Thank you all very much.